Good morning. This is session two of the BRL conference. I'm Alex Smith. I'll be chairing this session. Um, just so we have three talks going up, leading us up to 12.30, uh, which will be Alan Winfield starting with us today, and then Sabine Howard, and then Melon Linden Smith. So I'll just uh, go straight over to Alan, and he's talking about robot accident investigation. So good morning. Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, so can I just check you can see the slide, first slide? I guess so. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to be speaking this morning on robot accident investigations. So I'd like to start with um, asking you to imagine um, your elderly mother, uh, let's call her Rose, um, and she has an assisted living robot like the one in this picture. And uh, Rose's neighbor calls round um, and uh, finds Rose. Uh, Sorry. On the floor. Sorry, Len, I'll just stop you. Uh, we're still on the uh, openings. I can see the opening slide. Uh, you may have to full screen your slides. I have. Um, uh, <laughs> it's not, we, we can only see the, the opening slide open in uh, PowerPoint at the moment. Uh, well, I don't know what to do about that. If you um, stop uh, stop your stream for a second, mm -hmm. your, your shares. Uh, stop! Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Um, okay. And then, uh, if you can try and open the uh, PowerPoint, and then. Um, share and then click on share within the stream yard and find the find the window should be options okay this is this is the problem with tools that, yeah. that we've never used before so yeah. <laughs> okay, share. Um, uh, yep PowerPoint allow and shall I now just go straight to display you try, try a, uh, yeah. Now, can I, have you, can you see the second slide now? No, we're still on the, on the PowerPoint, unfortunately. Oh. I can see. What can you see now? We can see the PowerPoint um, from, from within the, the, not, not the slideshow, but from within PowerPoint. Right. Well, I mean, sure. Second just slide. Yeah. We can do it this way. We just use that. All right. Well, yeah. it's not ideal, is it? And I'll um, anyway. I'll, I'll try and and um, uh, minimise things if I can. How's that? There we go. That's pretty good. All right. Uh, so um, so yes. Imagine that your um, elderly mother uh, Rose has an assisted living robot to help her live at home independently. Uh, the robot's capable of fetching her drinks, reminding her to take a medicine and keeping in touch with family. But then a neighbor calls around and finds Rose collapsed on the floor. Um, and uh, in fact, she has a bruising. Uh, she's fine. Uh, she recovers OK. But there's bruising on her leg. And the question is, um, why didn't the robot raise the alarm? That's one of its functions. Uh, to, uh, to to notice if if there's a problem and, and raise the alarm and um, and did the robot in fact um, actually cause the accident um, did it cause the bruising on her legs um, if it didn't cause the accident why didn't it raise the alarm so these are really important questions now of course accidents happen so uh, accidents are uh, perfectly um, normal in um, uh, in industry. Um, the US Department of Labor, for instance, um, uh, has a web page uh, which uh, lists industrial accidents. Um, we know about driverless car accidents, um, like the, the first Tesla fatality in 2016, um, uh, because they're big news. And the only reason that we really know about social robot accidents is when they make the press. So this particular robot here um, uh, hurt a child. It's a security robot. And the only reason we know about it is because uh, it happened to be reported uh, in the uh, national press in the US. 
So uh, I have this project um, called RoboTips, uh, which is with a, a, a collaborative project with the University of Oxford. Uh, my long-term collaborator, Professor Marina Jarotka, in fact, is leading the project. And the project is really concerned with building tools for responsible robotics. So what is responsible robotics? Well, we define it as the application of responsible innovation in the design, manufacture, operation, repair, and end of life recycling of robots that seeks the most benefit to society and the least harm to the environment. So we're defining responsible robotics, therefore, as uh, the application of responsible innovation. Well, what is responsible innovation? It's actually um, a, a broad set of techniques, well-established techniques for uh, responsibly researching and innovating, which broadly covers the word cloud in the top right-hand corner. So open access, ethical governance, science communication, public engagement, and gender equality. So all of those things are part of responsible innovation, and they should be part of responsible robotics. So what are we doing in this particular project? Well, the first thing that we're doing, and a very important part of the project, is that we're developing what we call an ethical black box. Um, the idea here is very simple. It's very straightforward, which is that um, we believe that all robots, and in fact, by extension, AIs, should be fitted as standard with the robot equivalent of a flight data recorder, an aircraft flight data recorder. If you, if you don't do that, then you can't investigate accidents. Um, uh, flight data recorders, of course, are absolutely fundamental to aviation safety and, in fact, railway safety because they're also fitted in, in railways. And it would be unthinkable to have um, uh, to fly aircraft or run trains without these kind of um, data recorders. And we think that it, it should be equally unthinkable that we have robots that do not have such a device. So we're essentially developing um, the technology to build uh, and, and we're, we're building ethical black boxes for different robots. Uh, we're writing a specification, an open specification, um, and our industrial partners in the project are also helping us to uh, by building ethical black boxes for their robots. So we'll have a whole set of models of ethical black box by the end of the project. But of course, accident investigation is a human process. It's a process uh, that involves uh, human beings um, looking at the data from the, 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 the black box, if you like, the, the data recorder, but also forensic evidence and witness uh, statements. Uh, it's a process of, of putting together all of the evidence from those three things, the data recorder, the forensics, and the witness testimony, and figuring out uh, what caused the accident. Now, uh, a unique aspect of, of RoboTips, our project RoboTips, is that we're running, in fact, a set of three staged mock accident scenarios. Um, and they're going to be in assisted living robots, educational toy robots, and driverless cars. And for each of those, we're going to be staging a mock accident, a real accident. Of course, nobody will get hurt, but it's a staged accident, but with real robots and real humans. And we'll have human volunteers as firstly subjects of the accident. And of course, they'll be briefed on, on what's going to happen, but, but also human witnesses to the accident and as members of the accident investigation team. And of course, the witnesses and the, the team members will not be briefed on on what's going on. So they'll, they'll have to either give their testimony um, or figure out what's going wrong, uh, as it were, as if they, you know, fr from, from the beginning. So uh, the project, in fact, we're about, uh, we're in, in, in about the um, second of, of, of five years. And of course, we should have run the first uh, accident scenario already, except for the uh, the pandemic. Of course, we couldn't do this because the the lab uh, hasn't been open for this kind of um, uh, of multi-person uh, uh, experiment, and of course still isn't. So 
uh, we're still waiting to be able to run the first of these experiments. But fortunately, because it's a five-year project, uh, we have time to, to catch up. Now, the purpose of accident investigation is essentially about learning. And there are three questions. Uh, what actually happened? Uh, why did it happen? And how can uh, we make sure that, that it doesn't happen again? So uh, really the aim of any accident investigation is to come up with practical, achievable recommendations for making safety improvements to make sure it doesn't happen again. So the purpose of accident investigation is learning. Um, and this, um, uh, this uh, motto, anybody's accident is everybody's accident, is the, is the motto of um, the aviation uh, accident, um, uh, if you like, community. Uh, of course, aviation accident investigation is a very well-developed um, uh, process, uh, very highly regarded. It's the gold standard, if you like, of, of accident investigation. And it's really important in aviation that, that they share data. So the point is that, that any accident uh, of any aircraft um, will be the, the out the results of, of the investigation will be shared with all of the manufacturers um, because you know other aircraft, even different aircraft, might still have the same kind of fault. Uh, and faults, of course, can be operational as well as, as technical. So hence this idea that anybody's accident is everybody's accident. And we think that the same uh, culture needs to be in robot accident investigation. Now, why do we think that social robots need accident investigation? Well, um, of course, uh, robot accidents are rare, but we think the scope for accidents with social robots is much greater than with first wave industrial robots. Why is that? Well, firstly, because industrial robots operate behind safety cages, social robots do not. They're designed to be among us, up close and personal. Secondly, Industrial robots are, of course, in, in environments optimized for them and not humans. That's not true for social robots. Social robots work uh, are designed to work with uh, humans up close and personal. And thirdly, of course, the scope of harms is much greater because uh, social robots can cause psychological harm as well as, as physical harm. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have time to go into the, the kind of ethical harms uh, that could be caused by social robots. But essentially, we think that the scope of accidents uh, for accidents is much greater. And the reason I've said accident and incident investigation is to make the point that um, in aviation and railways, not we, we don't just investigate um, accidents that, that, that caused serious harm or damage we also investigate near misses. So in other words, accidents that, that might have happened, but did not. Um, and near miss accident investigation has been shown to be just as effective uh, in improving safety as, as, as the investigation of the serious accidents. And we think that near miss um, investigation, that is incident investigation, is also important in social robots. So let's now turn to uh, to this scenario that I started with, Rose's fall. So let's look at the witness testimony. So the neighbor finds Rose on the floor in the kitchen and calls for a paramedic. The paramedic uh, attends to Rose, but reports seeing the robot in the living room. So not uh, where Rose uh, fell and, and had the accident. And the paramedic also notice, notices Rose is not wearing her fall bracelet. So any of you who have an elderly mother like mine, like I do, will know that uh, panic alarms um, and fall bracelets are quite commonplace. The cleaner reports that he cleaned as usual, including disinfecting the robot as instructed. Um, and finally, of course, Rose herself uh, reports that she wanted something from a kitchen cupboard and climbed onto a chair to reach it and fell. She also remembers calling out for help. So there's clearly a lot of clues. There's a lot of important information in the witness testimony. So now look, let's look at the, the results from the ethical black box. Now, of course, the ethical black box just contains a bunch of numbers, 
but um, typically we will need tools, which we're also developing, to allow you to visualize and interpret the data from the ethical black box. And this is a kind of um, a visualization that we can imagine. We haven't yet uh, got to the stage of, of, of building um, uh, real visualization tools. In fact, we have students doing that work right now. So the big um, blue arrow in the middle is the timeline going from left to right. And the red arrow shows Rose's fall. Um, and uh, so the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, um, we can assume that um, Rose was discovered by her neighbor uh, at zero hours. And, and the, the estimate of half an hour before then uh, Rose's fall is just an estimate. So the, the point is that, that the robot doesn't know uh, that Rose fell. That's part of the problem. So this is just an estimate. Now, the red boxes at the top are interactions between the robot and Rose. So it waits for instructions. Uh, it reminds Rose to take a drink of water. It tells Rose it's lost connection with the Wi-Fi. Well, that's curious, isn't it? And then again, it reminds Rose to take medicine and drink water. And again, um, about an hour before we think she fell, uh, she tells Rose that it lost a connection with the Wi-Fi. Again, that's, 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 there's something wrong there. And the blue boxes show the robot moving around. It leaves its charging station about four hours before the accident. It moves to the living room, it moves to the kitchen, it moves to the living room, and is still apparently searching for Rose when the neighbor calls around. And then the green boxes are uh, the status of the connection uh, with the home hub, the Wi-Fi connection. And you can see that ro the robot loses connection with the home hub uh, and then and then that's just before it reports that to Rose, which is kind of mad because what would Rose do about it? And then again here. So we know that the robot didn't have a connection with the home hub twice um, and critically uh, um, less than an hour before we think Rose fell. So what are we going to do with all of this information? We have witness testimony and we have information from the ethical black box. Well. Um, We've um, uh, we're recommending in a new paper. The new pa the paper is is out uh, roundabout now. It, it should be um, uh, published in the next week or so. Called robot accident investigation, um, and we're recommending the use of uh, of a technique called a why because graph. So this rather complicated graph essentially um, is a way of connecting events to consequences. So um, and there are four different kinds of boxes. So the square boxes are events, and clearly um, Rose's fall is an event. And uh, the robot failing to raise the alarm is also an event. Um, and actually, you can see that that really we've we've this, this, we've realized here that there are two accidents. Um, and then these um, boxes with corners uh, are processes. So these are actions. Uh, pertinent to the accident, things that happened. Uh, states, the, the triangular boxes, are states uh, that remain true for the whole of the uh, period of the accident. And these round boxes are unevents. In other words, they're events that should have happened but did not. We call them unevents. And you can see that, um, well, essentially, uh, Rose decides to try and, and reach a high cupboard. That's an event. Um, climbs onto the chair, that's a process, and then slips off the chair. And of course, that causes the fall. So it's fairly clear that the reason uh, we believe that Rose uh, had the accident is because of her unwise decision to climb onto the, the, the chair in the kitchen. But why did the robot fail to cause the alarm? Well, it was clear that the, the robot's fall detection system was not triggered. And that was caused, that has multiple causes. So we have at least uh, four or possibly five different routes to this accident. So firstly, Rose calls out for help. She said that she called out for help, but the robot is too far from Rose to hear her. So there's a problem with the microphone perhaps in the Rose, uh, in, in the robot, sorry. And also the robot has sensor errors because uh, even if it had been close enough, uh, it probably wouldn't have, have, have noticed that, that 
Rose slipped off the chair. And we think the sensor errors might because, be because the cleaner is disinfecting, if you like, scrubbing the sensors, uh, which would probably not be a good idea. And of course, we know that Rose was not wearing her fall bracelet. The paramedic reported that. Um, and critically, and this is a critical failure here, the failure of the robot's wireless connection to the home hub means that the data from the home hub is not reaching the robot's fall detection system. But even if it did, the robot can't raise the alarm because it's not connected to the Wi-Fi. So here we have a pretty um, good understanding with this why because graph of the cause causes and um, multiple causes and effects uh, of what actually turned out to be two accidents. So what are the key findings and remedies? Well, um, it's clear, as I, as I just mentioned, that Rose's fall was caused by her unwisely climbing onto a, care, a chair. Um, and really, um, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, well, uh, of course, you know, if anyone has an elderly mother, we're, we're constantly reminding them not to do things like that. Uh, but of course, um, uh, you know, uh, people don't always do what they're told. Accident two, well, the robot's failure to raise the alarm was caused by a combination of failures. And the recommendations are, number one, we equip the robot with a backup communication system. It's no good relying on Wi-Fi. I mean, Wi-Fi fails, we all know that. So we need to build in, um, if you like, a telephone connection so that um, a built-in, if you like, a, a mobile phone or, or equivalent, um, so that the robot can call um, uh, via this backup communication system. It can call um, an emergency number. It can even send a message that its Wi-Fi has failed. So it can call the maintenance uh, you know, company for the robot. Then we need to equip the home hub with the ability to send an emergency call directly when the fall bracelet is triggered. It's crazy that that uh, fall bracelet triggering has to go via the robot. We need to improve the sensitivity of the robot's microphones add a new function to the robot so it reminds Rose to put on her fall bracelet. And of course, it's also crazy that the robot's reporting to Rose that that uh, uh, that it's, it's wife, that the Wi-Fi connection has failed. So remove that function. And finally, and this is, you know, these are uh, uh, operational changes, uh, advise the cleaner not to use disinfectants on the robot's sensors. So there we have, if you like, a mock accident and a mock accident investigation. Uh, and that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, and I want to acknowledge, of course, EPSRC, who are funding this, um, the project team, uh, Marina Jirotka uh, and Helena Webb uh, at Oxford, and my colleague here in the lab, uh, Anouk Van Maris. Um, and uh, uh, we, we have papers, um, so the papers on both on, uh, on the case for the ethical black box and the robot investigation paper. Um, uh, those are both available. You can uh, email me if you'd like to get copies of those papers. Um, also um, on my blog, um, there's lots of articles. I've written quite a few blog posts about this project um, over the last year or so. And uh, very recently, in fact, as part of the um, National Robotics Week, uh, we uh, recorded a, um, a kind of radio play of a, a, a different slightly different version of Rose's accident, and that's available as a podcast on the Oxford Barts uh, web page. So you can check that out if, if you're at all interested. So thank you very much indeed uh, for listening, and um, I'll be very happy to um, uh, to answer some questions. Uh, thanks, Alan. If, um, if you are interested in robotic ethics, uh, anything ethics ethic related to do with robots, um, really do check out Alan's, Alan's work. He's uh, uh, one of the leaders in the field and knows probably more than anyone I know about robotics, I think. Thank you. Uh, uh, um, if you... I'm sorry about the, uh, mi the you know, <laughs> um, that was disappointing that we couldn't run the slides. I, th I think it, it looked it looked good enough I think, okay. for, the, for, for what we needed. So if you have any questions, uh, please do post them in the chat um, and I can Bring them up on the screen for you. So I uh, thank you from uh, Ben Kataswaran.
yes. Um, in fact, uh, Benki is 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 one of the master students who's working with me on this. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you, Benki. That's great that you were able to check in. Okay. Oh, Andy, Andy West. Uh, users of ROS will be familiar with recording data with a ROS bag file. What does the black box need beyond a simple carbon copy of all the robot data? Well, um, I mean, Andy, you're, you're quite right. Um, and in fact, um, one of the um, implementations uh, that uh, Anouk is working on, um, the Miro robot, is in fact using the ROS bag file. Um, uh, and it, it's, um, you're right that, that you know, most of, of the data is very straightforwardly captured, but, but what, we, what we're looking for in the ethical black box is not just the raw data, um, but also the reasons for decision. So we're kind of, you know, we would like uh, the controls, the robots control system to, to actually be able to, uh, to feed uh, the black box with reasons, if you like, high level reasons for, for uh, those decisions. Um, now, that's, of course, a not straightforward always, particularly, I mean, if, if the robot's running an, an artificial neural network, that might be very difficult. But with algorithmic control systems, it should not be too difficult. Um, uh, so, but yes, you're right. I mean, robots that run ROS, um, then constructing the, the black box is relatively straightforward. Although we do have to worry about um, um, uh, security of the data, integrity of the data, and the fact that the 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 ethical black box needs needs to always save the most recent n hours of data. I mean, you know, uh, an aircraft flight data recorder typically records the most recent, I think, seventeen hours of flight. Um, and, and an automotive event data recorder, it's only thirty seconds. But the point is that you need to organise the data so that you're always recording the most recent data, and if you like, uh, losing. The, the oldest data. I hope that answers the question. I think there's a, also a point there with ROS bags. If you um, if you record everything that the robots producing, like uh, camera streams, you mm. quickly end up collecting a lot of useless um, data and video stream stuff. Mm. So it's it needs to be a bit more complicated than just the ROS bag. I think. Uh, we have time for probably one more question, if anyone has anything. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> um, I was going to ask, actually, I mean, so you, you did mention uh, automotive black boxes, which were recorded 30 seconds. Yeah, event data recorders, they're called. Is that is that um, something that's like strictly in Teslas or is that in no, uh, um, most modern cars? Um, essentially, there are there is a standard, uh, uh, an IEEE standard uh, for these in draft. But right now, there is no standard for event data recorders. And those manufacturers that choose to put them in the car essentially design them themselves. So they're proprietary designs. And 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 it's actually the situation is even worse than that because um, the data is owned by you know Tesla or whoever it is Waymo or uh, Uber um, and uh, essentially the the accident investigators have to rely on the company volunteering that data. Now with aviation that's not the case. I mean the, the data is you know the, the data is. Uh, going to be made available to the accident investigation by law, not because the, you know, the, uh, the airline agrees or the, the, or the plane manufacturer. So, so, um, so there's a long way to go before um, we have the equivalent, although it's clearly necessary that we have, um, you know, uh, event date recorders in autonomous vehicles, if not, you know, non-autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles. And it's interesting that I saw on Twitter just yesterday that the NTSB who investigate um, uh, road 
you know, vehicle accidents in the US uh, are mandating that companies like Tesla report on all accidents and incidents to them. Uh, so that's the first step, I think, towards regulating the process of accident investigation in PV. And it's a welcome step. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to have to say goodbye to you now, Alan. It's been excellent having you here. Thank and, you. Uh, well, then, um, catch up with you later. Uh, so our next speaker is Sabine. Uh, Sabine Howitt, who is the um, professor of this one. That is here at the BRL. Uh, and uh, she will be talking about out-of-the-box swarm solutions for intralogistics. And um, if you got your slides ready to go, excellent. Okay, I'll hand you over to Sabine. Great, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining this talk. I'll be telling you about my work quite broadly, engineering swarms um, across scales and what we think uh, this has the potential to translate to in the world of intralogistics. So as a swarm engineer, uh, very often what inspires me is swarms in nature. And if you look at this flock of birds, they can do beautiful complex dances in the sky. And that's the result of every bird interacting with their local environment. There's no one leader bird telling every bird what to do. And this has many features that are useful for real world applications. So for example, as you keep adding birds to the flock, the flock continues to operate so it can scale to large numbers. If a bird falls to the ground, the whole flock doesn't crash to the ground, so they're robust to individual failure. And together they can do more than the sum of their parts. For example, they might be better here at avoiding predators. And so when you're a swarm engineer, you start to see examples of swarming or self-organization everywhere around you, whether it's these flocks of birds or ants as they create trails to your picnic table, or bees as they make decisions about their next nest site, or our ability to grow fully functioning human beings from just a couple cells. Now the challenge is, uh, very often, we, we have a task, a swarm task that we'd like to achieve. We'd like to do collective motion. We'd like to optimize trails. We'd like to do decision-making or consensus formation, or we'd like to grow structures or functional shapes. But we what we need to discover is the design of those individuals and how those individuals interact with the world around them. And that's ultimately the puzzle that we solve as swarm engineers. Now we in, in our team have been going about that in two different ways. One way is to use bioinspiration because we're grateful that biologists have studied uh, some of these systems before us and can give us tips and ideas on how we might implement rules of swarming in engineered solutions. And the other strategy is sometimes we have a swarm behavior we want to achieve. Say you want to create a communication network and as a disaster site, for example, or you want to organize boxes in a warehouse. Well, maybe you don't have a parallel in the natural world that can give you your rules. And in that context, what you need to do is, is explore the rule base. So you could explore those local rules by guessing them. You could explore them by having lots of people guess them, which is a form of crowdsourcing. Or indeed, increasingly, we use machine learning as an automatic way to discover the rules that give us desired swarm behavior. So just to give you a taste of bio-inspiration, here's an example of a couple behaviors uh, that we've done over the years that take inspiration from nature. On going clockwise on the upper left, you see a swarm of, of um, aerial robots. There's 10 of them doing flocking rules inspired from how the birds do that and their GPS trajectories. On the upper right here, you see a swarm of 100 of these coin-sized robots called kilobots, originally designed at Harvard, that are forming trails between that release point and that second element in the environment. And you'll notice it looks very messy, a lot of random walk. Uh, but as soon as they start to find that element, these trails form. On the bottom right, you're looking at a form of consensus formation with robots that are blue or red communicating locally a decision. So that decision is the blue or the red. The hope is that the swarm as a whole reaches the consensus blue. So they should all turn blue. Um, and what you can see here is this mix of blue and red converging to blue. And again, a lot of messiness, random motion, and yet quite robustly, these swarms are able to reach the desired consensus. 
And on the bottom left here, what you're looking at is a form of morphogenesis. We're inspired from how cells interact by, by sending signals to each other. We can get these spots emerge, which is inspired from Alan Turing's spots. You see those on animals, on zebras. And then you can see these limbs that basically grow uh, into, into interesting shapes. And these shapes are, um, they're adaptable, they're robust. If you chop off those limbs, they regrow. So we get a lot of features for free with swarming uh, just through these very simple local interactions. Now, uh, when you don't have that bio-inspiration, what we then revert to is exploration. And here what you're seeing is work with Matthew Studley and Alan Winfield and Simon Jones, essentially doing online evolution of controllers. And why do I say online? That's because the controllers are being evolved directly. Let me play this for you again on board the GPUs that are on these robots. So their task is to push this Frisbee to one side of the arena. Um, we don't tell them how to do that. They evolve a solution using a form of, of machine learning. And then over 15 minutes only, they figure out a way to robustly push this Frisbee to one side of the arena. And something that we care about when we're doing machine learning is to actually come up with solutions that are human readable so that we can peer into that black box and make sense of what the swarm decided were its proper local rules. So this is what these controllers look like. They're behavior trees that, that are often used in the gaming industry, and they're quite intuitive in terms of walking through those trees. You can color code them and you can gain an intuition about what the robots were doing at what point in time so that you can start to understand what was evolved um, on, on, on these individual robots. So I think we've... Um, reached a stage um, where we actually have the ability to design algorithms using different methods. We, we are able to design different types of hardware platforms. Uh, I didn't show you many of the robots that we've been building, whether they're in the air or on the ground or in the water uh, or actually in the body. So if you're ever interested about the micro nano robots that we do for cancer treatment, please ring me up. I'd be happy to tell you about that. But we can do algorithms. We can do hardware. And I think we're at a stage where, where we should start making swarms for people and getting these swarms out into the real world. And so how do we do that? Well, I think that the first stage is communicating with the public. So we run two nonprofits called robohub.org and aihub.org to connect the robotics and AI communities to the public so that we can tell them about the research that we're doing within our different areas. But we've also been running different outreach events so that we can ask the public what they would do with swarms. So here you see before COVID a little escape room that we built where we would lock participants in a room and over 40 minutes they would need to break out um, uh, learning about swarm robotics on the way. And at the end we could ask them where they thought swarms would be useful um, and what the risks to, or versus the benefits to society were. And you can see the wealth of different examples that they came up with, many which we had been thinking of, like cleaning the ocean of plastic, construction, inspection, um, so medical application search and rescue, some that we hadn't thought of like massages. So it's always interesting to see what the public has as ideas. Farming as well uh, came up in agriculture. So lots of potential for these technologies. And then um, what we decided to do was to drill in a little bit through user studies. Um, so we did three user studies last year um, in the area of logistics, interlogistics, um, in the area of infrastructure monitoring. So can we use a swarm to, to inspect infrastructure like a bridge? Um, and then in the area of firefighting and asking whether swarms could be useful in the context of, of either gathering information in the context of a fire or um, mitigating, mitigating those fires. And what was really interesting with these conversations is that this was done by, by many students who were either at the start of their PhD or during their PhD to help inform the technology that they were developing. And it was quite encouraging to see that actually no one, you know, science fiction didn't come up in those, those conversations. It didn't go full on into Black Mirror or to Big Hero 6. It was very concrete about the unmet need that these different areas had within their discipline. So in the case of the warehouse logistics, we spoke to small retail, for example, and they would tell us, you know, no one's organizing our stock room in the back. Some of the items are perishable. And so we can't, we can't capture that. And they, you know, that they go bad. And so there were a lot of unmet needs, little places where they could use help from something like a swarm technology. And, and we needed to figure out what those areas of unmet need were. And on top of that, they would, they would show excitement. They would say, sure, we'd be happy to have a swarm to help us gather information in the context of, of a fire, but, 
And that but was really instrumental because the but is, but we need to make sure that the swarm works. We need to make sure that it's trustworthy. We need to know how to control it and to understand at least at some level what it's doing so that we can, that we can have confidence that it's working in the right way. And so I'm going to drill in in particular in the area of intralogistics because this concept of unmet need, we realized while, while um, big companies like Amazon or Ocado might have large numbers of robots that they're able to deploy in their warehouses, there's actually a lot of places that could benefit from multi-robot systems that currently can't deploy them because either um, you know, the, their environment is messy or it's not well structured or they would need to install infrastructure to make it work. And really what they need is an out of the box solution for these swarms to be deployed within their environments. So we're thinking of an unmet need in the area of small retail, pop-up warehouses, reconfigurable manufacturing. And I think the concepts we're exploring in this area of unmet need could actually translate to larger warehouses and high value manufacturing further, further down the line. So, this area of unmet need and out, out of the box swarms, what it leads us to is a different way of thinking about, about multi-robot systems, right? So if you think of logistics, you're gonna think of your, your classical key performance indicators. You're gonna think of the speed of storage, the cost, the retrieval cost and store and speed, the inventory cost and speed. Those are the things you typically measure that have to do with performance. And I think where swarms shine is, is not just these KPIs, but also optimizing for the zeros. So how do we create a system that has zero training, zero scaling effort, meaning you could add more robots or remove robots and the system would still operate for different sized environments. How do you go for zero reconfiguration, zero failure mode, zero infrastructure, zero setup time. And so those zeros is the thing we need to add to the mix to really show the value of some of these swarm technologies. So. To help you wrap your head around this, uh, we wrote a paper last year on, on, on how we think this would look. So we're, we're, and the way we think this would look is through distributed situational awareness. So giving the capability of these simple robots, which actually are not so simple anymore, to interact and understand the world around them so that they can have those meaningful interactions with their environment. And let me just walk you through this one example. Uh, it's a thought experiment. And what it is, is a cloakroom. So imagine you're at a large event and there's a pop-up cloakroom to manage everyone's suitcase and jacket and whatever they want to leave at that conference venue, for example. Well, ideally, th there's two different ways of approaching this. You want to do it with robots. So if it were a centralized solution, you would set up a, set up a central hub and you would create a map of the environment in which you want to deploy your cloakroom solution. You would uh, record every robot in that system. And then when a user comes to deposit their jacket, they would interface with the central hub. The central hub would figure out which robot to call over, call over the robot. You would give your jacket to that robot. The robot that would be told by the central controller where exactly to store that jacket. There would be a database of where that jacket is stored so that you could look up exactly where that jacket is. And, and then um, if you retrieve your jacket, you would go back to the central hub. That central hub would need to remember where your jacket was stored, send a robot, plan its route to go and pick up that jacket and then bring it back to the user. Now that could work uh, in theory, but it does require connectivity. It requires you know, careful mapping of the environment before you deploy it. It requires things to not change over time. So if that box gets moved by someone, how do you replan? How do you know where that box is? So there's a some, certain number of constraints to that solution. If you take a distributed approach or a swarm approach, the way that scenario would work is that um, you would basically put lines on the floor for the outline of that cloakroom. So you wouldn't put in place a map. Um, instead, you'd take ideally, uh, this is a conceptual scenario, the robots out of the box, and then the user would arrive with their own app um, on their phone that's called the Cloakroom Swarm app. Uh, and they would basically say, hey, I'm over here in this corner. I have a jacket to give you. And they would basically put it on the robot and scan the QR code on the, on the robot's box. Um, and so that would be recorded in their app. Uh, the robot would navigate over the Cloakroom and deposit it anywhere. It could be random location, maybe an area where there's not too many other boxes to not clutter the space. Uh, um, so no map needed, just some ability to move around that world. And then when the user comes back, they call through their app and through the swarm that they're looking for the, the jacket with QR code 10. Um, and because there's so many robots in our system, 
basically your robot will be near enough to that box that it'll be like, oh, I see it, I found that box, and it'll be able to bring it back to the user. So here what's interesting is that we don't have a map uh, of the environment, we haven't stored the information of where that box is, but we have a very rapid lookup capability, so we could give you real-time information about that arena uh, without having to store it in a database. And there's no central point of failure. Every user has their own app uh, to be able to deploy this system. So these are the types of things that we're thinking about in terms of distributing um, intelligence across the swarm and making uh, use of their ability, the robot's ability, to perceive and interact with their local environment. So with this in mind, over the past three years, the Toshiba, we've been building um, the dots for distributed organization and transport systems. So the dots um, here are, are, are quite sophisticated robots. You can see one, I don't know if I'm pointing in the right direction, but you can see one on the floor there. Uh, we've got 20 of them, they were designed by Simon Jones. Um, they've got really fast um, motion, omnidirectional, four cameras, uh, with 120 field of view with independent Raspberry Pis to do some of the computation. They have laser time of flight um, scanners. They have a lifting platform so we can actually transport uh, some of these boxes or, or the jackets if you want to think of the cloakroom scenario. Um, they have GPUs so we have good computation um, and communication as well as a pretty good battery life of around six hours. So now all of a sudden we have the types of platform that allow us to think about how we design these swarms uh, for interlogistics. And I should say this cloakroom scenario that you saw here is also part of a new project that we have as part of the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems node and an evolving functionality in Bristol, where we'll be thinking about how you make this cloakroom trustworthy and how do you design it so that we have confidence in how it works. So here are the dots uh, in action, just a little teaser of what this looks like. We've built a new industrial swarm arena uh, that's dedicated to these 20 robots that we've built, that's 5G. Uh, kitted as well um, to start uh, playing around with these these ideas that we have about swarm intralogistics um, and um, we also have a, a, a realistic 3D simulator that models all the cameras all the sensors that we need from the robot which means that we can we can in a digital twin style way click a button and go from the simulation to the real robots um, while that's true code wise there's still we're still in calibration mode to make sure that that works um, in the correct manner. And if you want to get a sense for what those first trials look like, this is um, a competition that we've been running uh, that finished last week um, that was about, uh, it was an international competition. We had some, seven teams from around the world using our software uh, twin as well as the hardware, um, looking at how we could distribute food and in sort of a, a food um, emergency situation. And so here is the winning team. You can sort of see the speed at which they're able to quickly find these boxes and bring them to one side of, of the area, which is the deposit area. And single click uh, to the right, you can see what the code looks like when it's running on the robots in fully autonomous um, mode. Um, so we're, we're starting to get the tools to really make have a bit of fun uh, with this. And if you're interested, there's a whole blog talking about the results of that competition. Um, we also do research with low fidelity simulators because we're interested in what happens when you've got 100 robots, when you have giant warehouses, when there's tons of boxes. And unfortunately, the high fidelity simulators are too slow for us to very quickly um, go over parameters, evolve solutions using machine learning. And so our low fidelity simulators also allow us to have fun with this. And you'll notice it looks different than what you'd expect. You'd expect you know, a planned, you know, well-controlled robot system. This is random walk. And actually with random walk, just finding a box, putting yourself under it and pulling it to the side of the arena you want to deposit it in gives us pretty good performance in terms of time if you have the right number of robots. So, so um, we're starting to get good data showing that there's credibility in using these types of approaches um, in the field. And increasingly, we're thinking about the interface. So what is the, what does this twin actually look like? How do you... Um, measure the performance of the system. How do you check that it's operating correctly? How do you, you know, do you, if you don't know where the jacket is as the user, are you happy to know that a certain robot has gone to pick it up? Are you happy to know that it's been located? Like what level of information do you need? And if you're the operator of that swarm of the cloakroom, how do you quickly change the behavior of the swarm if it's not operating the way you want? And so that's where these twins make sense because in the, in the digital world, you could quickly optimize a solution and push it to the robots uh, and go back and forth, basically, um, so that you're able to, to get the, the, the results that you want out of that system. 
So I mentioned interlogistics. I also wanted to highlight some other swarms in the real world that we've been playing with. Um, so this is one with wind racers and distributed avionics, looking at how we can create swarms of robots to extinguish forest fires or for aid delivery. And there again, we're thinking of huge scales, um, you know, scale of a country. How do you, how do you, how many robots do you need? How do they need to be coordinating? Um, and how, again, can we use these digital twins to quickly tweak uh, some of the behaviors? And uh, working underwater, looking at how we can monitor structures of basking sharks. So that's more on the biology side. And just recently this week, we were in a mall at Cabot Circus in Bristol with this new swarm. Uh, we have a hundred of these tiles and together they can form, uh, we call them mosaics, but basically they help us gather opinions of crowds or we help them brainstorm or helps them. And in, in basically they're enablers of human interaction. So it's sort of a ro human robot swarm. And we're hoping that they can, they can, um, be used to tackle interesting questions. So at Cabot Circus, we were asking the public about what measures to take against climate change. And they could go to the robots, see what others had entered as opinions. They could enter their opinion and that would live on through a physical avatar um, in that space. So we've just started playing around with these. If you have a, there's industry here listening and you have an idea of a workshop you want us to run with these tiles, uh, we're, we're open to ideas. So I think we're in the, on the way of trying to make swarms for people. It's still early days, but if we are gonna make swarms for people, we're going to need to make them trustworthy. And so with this in mind, we're also just starting to wrap our head around what that would look like. And I think Alan Winfield's presentation is a great example of some of the things we should implement um, to, to basically check that our swarm operated in the way we wanted it to operate it. Should anything go wrong or what was the issue uh, with the swarm if something did go wrong? Um, and th there's many more measures to think about. What are the ethics of these systems and how they're used? What are the legal requirements? Uh, what is the accountability when you're looking at a swarm as a whole? Um, how does that swarm interact with the user? So the swarm um, can convey a state to the user so the user can understand them, but also so the user can control the swarm in a meaningful way. Um, you always have elements of individuals. So does the individual work? Could it cause physical harm? Uh, is it secure from attack? Um, and what about the swarm? Because the swarm is more than the sum of their parts. So you always need to think about the emergent behavior. So is the emergent behavior safe? Is the emergent behavior secure? And, and is there an element of verification that we could do or testing that we could do to build confidence um, in, in these systems? So um, I hope I've walked you through some of the things that we're thinking of bringing swarms into the real world. Intralogistics is, is one angle that we're currently pursuing, but open to other ideas where you have multi-robot needs. Um, a lot of this work is cross-disciplinary, and I didn't touch on the micro and nanorobots that we do for, for biomedical applications. Um, but a special thanks um, to all my collaborators and, and uh, various sources of funding. And I think I'll call that a day. Can I hear you, Alex? I, I still can't, Alex. I don't know why, because you, you're you clearly not muted anymore. Sorry, now I hear you. Is that, I'm back? Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> yes, so Mike Williams is asking, is there an optimal swarm size or is it application dependent? Uh, is there a max size before it becomes uncontrollable? That's one of the parameters we always vary is what is the right swarm size because although we say you can keep adding swarms and it continues to work, that's not true. And it's especially not true in bounded environments. So we have an interesting experiment where we had, we were doing area coverage, which is exploration. We're trying to scatter and cover as much area as possible. And Edmund Hunt had this idea of depositing negative pheromones so that you would scatter away from areas that you had already visited and others would scatter away, uh, away from those areas too. And so uh, it sounded like that made a lot of sense because you would, you would explore more efficiently. But if you have too many robots, you actually hinder the behavior of the robots because they keep blocking each other. And so that's one example where there was a sweet spot in the number of robots to be deployed. Um, uh, with the, the morphogenesis, so those shapes with weird limb structures that form, that one had a critical mass. So you needed a certain amount of robots for that to even work. So that's a case where you needed you needed large numbers and the small numbers wouldn't work. For some of the interlogistics things that we're looking at, it's mostly performance driven. So small numbers of robots can often do the job, but you have to wait longer. And so we're sort of trying to understand what the sweet spot is there. And you can imagine if you have too much, you get crowding again. So um, there is, I think there is often an optimal and we never know what that is. 
Thanks, Matt. Uh, we have a question from Woody. What was the low fidelity simulator written in and are there any specific libraries used? Um, that one was written in Python. We, uh, it's, it's open source, so MS Paper has a Git um, to it, so you could download it. We, we, we've, been, we've been trying to bring everyone on board with a common simulator, but everyone likes to do their own cooking. But, so it's, it's not very difficult in the sense that it's dots on screens that have certain radius to them, communicate within a certain radius, and then react to their local environment based on their position. Um, so it's, it's, it's often possible to create your own in whatever tool you're interested in, whether it's Python or MATLAB or C++. I think there's um, there's one that's quite an old one called Boyd, B O I D S, yeah. which is um, mm -hmm. a very quite an early swarm simulator, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, the high fidelity s s uh, simulator is all gazebo based, so that one we're really using off the shelf tools. Yeah. Uh, so I think just one more question uh -huh. um, from Matthew Starkey: Is are there any companies actively working with swarm robotics at the moment? So, well, well, this collaboration with Toshiba over the past three years is really is really about swarm robotics and how you create these network systems and how they could be deployed. So, um, they're definitely interested in that. And actually, I'm seeing this bubble up all around me. I've, there's periods in research where you see that there's excitement in something. So, Rind Racers, for example, with their drones, are currently exploring how to use swarms um, for, for some of these large-scale deployments. Uh, I think anywhere where a single robot or two or three robots doesn't cut it in terms of the application you want to do is starting to think of either centralized multi-robot systems or decentralized systems. And when you think of decentralized, these swarm concepts kind of click really well. So, so I'd say um, there's definitely a, a pull right now. Uh, we do actually have time for another quick question. Um, Devin Wang has asked if there's any PhD positions available at the moment. There's not an open one, but that's not really how it works. So, so um, there's the Farscope CDT, which you might want to check out because a lot of my PhD students have gone through there. Um, and when I have a position opening in Swarm Robotics, I typically put it on my website. So you can check out my website on the jobs job sector. Um, there's different ways to get PhD studentships, whether it's it's CDTs or DTPs. You can write down some of those words. Um, and uh, it, it also depends a little bit on what for sources of funding you can find. So I've just added a link in Thanks. the chat to Farscope if anyone's interested. Farscope mm -hmm. is, um, is the CDT program at, at BRL. I think we normally have 10, 10 PhD students per cohort um, and you can, on a wide range of things. So feel free to look. I think you'll have to be applying for next year. Um, the next load because we've already done this year but there's cool. there's actually one phd open in my team right oh. now in collaboration with bioethics and we're looking at the scenario what we're looking at how you do trustworthy autonomous systems with micro nano swarms so it's 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 um looking at how you would regulate that how you would consider that so if you're interested in the mix between ethics and swarms there's something open and you can email me <laughs> okay thanks very much sabine uh I think we'll move on to the next talk, um, which is with Lyndon Smith and Mel Smith, unrelated. Uh, Lyndon, are you? Hi, yeah, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Hi, Lyndon. Yeah, good. Here we are. <laughs> Great. So, uh, is, is Mel joining us as well? Um, I don't know if he's joining for the questions or not, but I've got a little presentation I can show you. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. If you show your slides, and then um, I guess we can go straight into it. Yeah, I've got this little recording here. That's okay. I need to share my screen. If, if, uh, I don't know if that works. Let's see. Oh, hang on a second. I'm just trying to share my screen. So, slight technical issues. No, we've not been too bad today. There we go. So if, I, share, okay. if you uh, should just change to your the window that you want. I've got this presentation I can show you. Um, oh, yes. Your questions and answers after that, if you like. Yeah, um, sure, yeah. Let's get this one going here. Let's see. Let's go. Here we go. Oh. Hello, I'm Lyndon Smith. I'm the professor in computer simulation and machine vision at UWE. And um, I'd like to give a little talk today about robot vision. Um, let's talk about robot vision for start. What is robot vision? 
Well, um, I would say it's machine vision that's powerful enough to allow tasks to be undertaken robotically. And we can achieve this by gathering richer data, that's to say 3D as well as 2D data, and learning from experience. And then we exploit recent developments, as it says there, in 3D vision, like the Azure Connect camera, which is a very powerful RGBD camera, D for distance, it gives you range data, and AI, deep learning, convolutional neural networks, for example. So, talking a little bit more about the kind of things we've done in our lab and uh, the impact we've had is, would really involve describing things like CubeScan, PetroScope. These are different solutions we've had for industrial problems in different sectors, and we provided systems to clients all around the world in fact, over the last 20, 20 odd years. Harvest I, that's a commercially, a lot of the, these systems are commercially available um, and they're providing advanced functionality in case of harvest time, measuring the size of potatoes on a harvester in the field. Long contact real alignment in India, we'll talk about that, about that later on. New companies set up account conditional lameness monitoring, 3D conditional metrology, skin text analysis um, for the skin analyzer, which I'll talk about. We've got 12 patent applications. So what is machine vision then, since I just mentioned machine vision? Well, we have a system where we capture an image using commercial um, equipment, which is not that expensive, off the shelf, arranged in innovative ways. That could be 2D, 3D cameras, or even thermal or multispectral. And then we process the images and do analysis to get understanding from the scenes. Here we've got um, a non-contact vision system for measuring breathing, we developed from the NHS, NHIR grant. This is our uh, cow recognition, uh, sorry, our pig recognition system that we developed. And this is a system we developed, a 3D face recognition system we developed in London, which is now functioning in central London. You can see that in a lab in fact. So a whole range, that's just some examples, a whole range of applications. And uh, a lot of the time we're talking about, as I say, about 3D data acquisition. And uh, this is realized through a technique that we have been developing in the last 20 years called photometric stereo. And this involves one camera and a set of lights. The lights are in known positions, and we call that structure light. We turn one light on at a time and take an image each time. So we, if we had four cameras, we'd get four images. You can see they're illuminated from different angles here. Then we apply what we call a lighting model to get 3D and 2D data from the scene. So the actual 3D data we get is something called a bump map. So it's a dense array of surface noise. Each of these little arrows is the normal of the surface at that point. And then you can visualize this for, for rendering. And it's like a three dimensional model without any color. So we're getting three dimensional information. This is a system we use in London Underground. It, it, it can't be spoofed, face recognition that uses this technology. It can't be spoofed by holding a photograph of somebody else in front of your face, which most systems that exist at the moment can be. And we've used sort of exterior in a very wide range of applications, actually. I just uh, go, for example, to camouflage removal. We did a project for the MOD. So this is a, a mask we made up, three-dimensional mask we made up with colors. And then we had a camera in four lights and we captured these images. Then we applied a photometric stereo analysis and we got the surface gradients. It's a 3D, 3D surface. And so what we can do then is separate what we call the depth map, you know, distance from the camera, from the albedo. The albedo is just a color, it's a bit like a normal image of reflectivity. And uh, the project we did for the MOD uh, involved us going over and getting some, some, some equipment actually from, from uh, Toys R Us. We've got these uh, toy gun, guns and hand grenades. And I put them, or we put them onto a surface and do some pretty good camouflage. You can see it's not very obvious what we got there. Then we apply our technique, and you can see very clearly the 3D profile, what we have there is very clear. The camouflage is removed. It can be removed. It's quite a successful project for the MOD, they were quite pleased with that. What we could do is on different scales. You could use it on the large scale of the field or just a close up. Close, because it gives you this three dimensional information, which is quite useful. You can detect suspicious items under clothing, where you expose it and so on. So what I'd like to do now is go through a few case studies of uh, 
things that we've done in our lab and useful functionality we've produced. The first thing we did was uh, for a company called Quantronics in Salt Lake City. And uh, we developed this large scale metrology system for measuring uh, you know, air freight on pallets up to six feet by six feet by eight feet, so a pretty big scale. And uh, we made it for them and they, they sold it back to the UK actually. And uh, they told us they sold over a million pounds with the last time I spoke to them, a uh, million dollars worth, sorry. And uh, so it's easy, easy to operate, there's obviously nothing to crash into, it's all ceiling mounted there. And we got it working, it even works in quite bright lighting actually. So that was, that gave us the funding during that project to set up our machine vision lab, which we've been developing over the last 20 odd years. And that was our first important project. Other examples of projects we've done over the years include um, an aggregate analysis project called the Petroscope we did for a, a company in Iceland and he had nothing when he came to us this chap but we developed this for him and uh, he saw it started selling the system. So the idea is you do analysis of aggregate as it's being produced in the quarry rather than sending it off and waiting for two weeks. And in that way you can make sure you've got what you need. You can stop the um, mining if uh, you haven't got that kind of stone which is obviously better for the environment than carrying on digging it out and you don't kind of use it. So that's a petroscope. Then just showing a wide range of some applications that we did. Um, we had a project, a student said to me his father was running a company, a student one of my master's courses. I said, oh yeah, yeah. And then it turns out he did. And we developed the system for him for £100,000 and paid us. You can see that these pillars here contain cameras and lighting, lasers, and we are accurately able to produce a system that accurately measures wheel alignment and uh, completely non-contact. So you normally hang things on the wheels to do this, but this system is completely non-contact and we, after a lot of effort and work, we did get it working very accurately and he's now selling this thing. Then we have the photoelectric stereo system, which we know as, we call photo face, and this is the rig here. You see these infrared lighting here in a high speed camera. So, this applies for the exterior as you walk through it, designed for airports. And you can see the kind of resolution we could get from the skin. You can't really get this with other 3D cameras, they don't generally give you this kind of resolution. And uh, then we applied also photo exterior to the palm. And the idea here is to combine uh, wrinkles and um, skin textures into a new type of. Uh, biometric um, and we've got a very nice paper which I got accepted at a conference in San Diego later in this year will be presented on this, um, this hand scanner system. Good for the COVID situation is obviously non-contact you just hold your hand above the camera, below the camera when it's configured and then it will grab this information at high resolution without any contact with you with the palm. Better than the finger readers that you get in, on the entrance to, to sort of gyms and so on. Then a project which is very close to my heart is, of course, the UWE Skin Analyzer, where, again, we got photovoltaic stereo with six lights on a central camera, and we can recover fairly high-quality, high-resolution images of the skin. We can separate the 2D from the 3D and uh, also do uh, quite good teledermatology because we can, we can do interactive visualizations of the skin. We can move the virtual light around and we can move the viewing position around. So rather than we're with the patient, so it could be useful in Australia, say, when the doctor's in Sydney and the, the patient's in the outback and you can't travel so thousands of miles away. This could do it for you. And also we can measure the A, B, C, D characteristics, which are two different characteristics of moles. And we can measure it repeatedly and therefore we can detect change, which is a very good indicator of suspicious moles. At the moment it's very difficult for doctors to detect change in moles and therefore difficult for them to be reliably sending people to the specialist clinic. And here is an example of what we can do with it. So we have we uh, gather the albedo, which is like a reflectivity of the, of the mole, the, 2D, the pigment, the 2D picture. The pigment. And then we get the 3D textures and then we can combine them to get the 2D and 3D and this is where we can do the virtual visualization. And this can take teledermatology to a new level. So it's much more realistic than just the, the sort of webcam images we get at the moment so the moles that doctors are trying to appraise. So there's two areas, automated ABCD, there's three areas, there's automated ABCD, 
look at 3D textures as indicators, and then do this virtual virtual visualizations for telegraph topology. Now, just to show the wide range of uh, applications that we've had in our lab, I'm going from skin cancer with the skin analyzer to look at cows. This is a favorite project of mine, this one, because I, I'm surrounded by uh, farms here, and it's nice to have, and actually the farm we did this with is not far from here at my house here in Somerset, so, so it was nice to have a client nearby. And you can see here that we have a cd mounted camera which is measuring the 3D characteristics of the cow in terms of range data. And the, and the curvature, you can see that curvature of that spine, and that is actually related to whether the cow is lame or not. And so this is a new system that can measure all the condition of the cow, um, give it a condition score more objectively, and also can detect lameness and thereby avoid the, the, the need for culling the cow if it's not uh, proper right or whatever's wrong with it. So it's um, quite a nice system. We, this is now commercially available, it's working all around the UK. Arla are using this with their presentation. So uh, that was talking a little bit about some of the applications. You might ask, what are neural networks? Do they talk a bit about neural networks? Well, what they are is they're really a statistical modeling approach, um, but they're inspired by biological neural networks such as the brain. But in this case, the model is stored in the weights that connect the neurons. And uh, we have hidden layers, and we can, co we can model complicated um, relationships with these networks. And really, it became very successful after someone invented the idea of back propagation. And this is a way of training, training the network. So you put in your inputs, you have your outputs, you, you look at the error, and you go backward through the network to alter these weights to minimize the error. That's why it's called back propagation. So it's very powerful because it doesn't rely on any ideas of relationships. You don't assume it's a quadratic relationship or an exponential. Or whatever. It's just purely data driven, and we find it to be very powerful. And then the thing that makes it even more powerful is, is when we have convolutional neural networks, which is a bit of a more complicated concept, and I can't go into it in detail here. But basically, in this, some of the layers apply convolution, which is a, an image processing approach, uh, which is like in filtering, like you have in image processing software. And this um, uses these filters to characterize the image and detect features automatically. So as it says here, CNNs use convolution and require less pre-processing compared to other image classification algorithms. This independence from prior knowledge and human effort in feature design is a major advantage. In other words, we don't have to decide somehow what the features are we're looking for. The system does that for us. It automatically identifies the features of interest in images. And it's very powerful what it's done that. It can identify things even in the presence of changing light levels or changing perspectives and angles and it still detects um, objects of interest. It does, you could argue, what maybe many people thought neural networks years ago were capable of doing. You, know, you could detect pencils even if you've got lots of different images of pencils with different orientations. For example. It's a very powerful technique that we use a lot. And one example of that is the pig face recognition that Mark's been undertaking using convolutional neural networks. And we're getting better accuracy in terms of recognizing these pigs in alternative approaches. And we've replicated results in four open forms and play with pigs. We trained the neural network on the pig faces, so all these pigs look the same to us, but to a neural network, you can identify the difference. So we're identifying pigs without the need for the RFID tags in the ears, which are expensive and also harmful to the pig, really, and uh, can interfere with other radio frequency equipment on the farm. So it's, it's a good way to identify the pig. This next picture shows um, how the different regions on the face of the pig were scanned, how frequently they're scanned. So the redder is the more commonly it's used by the CNN. So you can see that certain parts of the image of the pig are actually more important for modeling the uh, what pig it is than other parts. We call that a heat map, what an area is in, of interest to the CNN. And also make sure that they we're not modeling something else, like whether there's something in the background when you've got a certain pig up and things like that. Another area we've worked in is plant analysis, and uh, we had Gittis, a student about to a good PhD in this. So again, he's been using um, CNNs, and I think from a mask, RCNN, to segment the leaves of a, of a plant as it grows. This is quite interesting because the leaves move around. You want to make sure that you're 
identify me correctly. And he was able to do this quite well with this mask I was seeing. And another application which is close to my heart is weed detection in grass. So we've got uh, low cost cameras, image analysis software. We're looking at commercial spray. The CNN, after we train it with certain images of grass with certain weeds in it, can automatically identify and segment the weeds, as you can see here. Red is the same for me. So then we can spray a bit of weed killer at the weed rather than spraying it everywhere. So we can save between 50 and 95% of the herbicide, which is obviously a great benefit to the environment, as well as saving a lot of money for the farm. So this is something we're going to see a lot more of in the future. We have a successful project working with a company, a farmer in Scotland, actually. So what we're talking about here then is um, robot vision that can use 2D or 3D data. And often both actually. So what we can do when we have this data is we can measure the dimensions of objects accurately and make a strange and calibrated environments. We can also uh, segment uh, features of interest uh, in the image. So, for example, if we have a 3D camera, we can use the range data to identify things in the foreground which are of interest in the presence of things in the background which we're trying to get rid of. Then we apply machine learning uh, for pattern recognition as opposed to simply doing metrology. So, in the, in the example of the skin analyzer I mentioned, there, we can do metrology of the image of the mole um, to measure automatically the A, B, C, D rules. A is asymmetry, B is border regularity, C is color variation, D is down. So we can do that, and we can do that now. That's not a problem. The machine learning comes in when we start doing slightly more complicated things like an analysis of textures. In the case of the skin, we might be analyzing the texture of the skin in 3D and we, we did do that, we found that the more irregularity there was in the texture of the skin, the more chance it was of actually being cancer. So that was interesting. We could do more work, especially deep learning, to identify other features, other indicators of moles which may indicate the presence of cancer or the tendency for cancer to appear. So having mentioned deep learning, um, what that provides, as it says here, is uh, Previously unseen robustness in real world environments. And uh, that is really useful because a lot of the time, what's been really limiting many machine vision applications and robot, robot vision applications has been variations in the environment. So you go outside and all the lights changing and uh, shadows are being cast. And this causes tremendous problems a lot of the time for conventional vision systems. But in the case of deep learning, you have a lot of, you need quite a lot of data to train it, but once you've done that, it's more robust in the presence of these kinds of variations. And if we can make it more robust and use vision systems and robot vision outdoors, this opens up all sorts of exciting opportunities. For example, we can develop robot systems that can interpret their environment and thereby undertake difficult tasks, maybe even in conjunction with human operators. Uh, and, but the robots might be able to do the more difficult, dangerous or dirty jobs in say a farm situation or mining or any other difficult um, application. And this is something that hasn't been possible up to now, but when we get this more rich data combined with this greater um, image understanding and scene understanding from deep learning, then we're facilitating a much more useful generation of robot vision systems. So that's really um, where we're coming from in uh, the Center for Machine Vision, in the BRL. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can always drop me an email and I'll get straight back to you. Uh, we're always interested in research collaborations and we deal with companies all the time. We work with companies, let's say, all around the world, but um, we have many projects going on in the UK at the moment. And I'd be very happy to talk to you. This is just an example. What I've given you here is just a, 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 a flash of view of, of, of some of the things we've done. I've many, many projects that haven't covered in these new emerging areas all the time. But one thing I would say, is that most of the time, the really, really exciting advanced technology is coming from the um, conjunction and combination of 3D data, along with 2D, and deep learning. So I hope that was of interest, and uh, 
as I say, if you've got any questions or you've got any applications or you think you might have an area we could explore, please do drop me a email. Thanks very much. Excellent. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, oh, good. I'm just trying to stop this thing from showing the screen now. Um, that's all good. It's, uh, that's, I think we're all good now. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you see me at all? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, I hope that was of some interest anyway. So uh, a little bit of background there on some of the stuff we've done. Has anybody yeah. got any questions? I think the first question I'd have, if someone showed me a, if anything like that, would be, how did you get the money to do it? <laughs> mm. You know, we got lots and lots of good ideas, but um, the big challenge all the time is getting some proper funding, really. So that, that, that's getting more difficult all the time, of course. Um, but uh, has anybody got any questions about anything on that, whether funding or technical side or anything like that? So I was going to ask Linda, actually, the um, the the system you were using to spot cows going through. Where did the funding come through from that one? Um, yeah, well, that was a that was an Innovate UK one, um, as most of our projects are, or at least a lot of them are. Innovate UK, you know, so in other words, government funding, and. Um, I think it was Lena over in Applied Sciences uh, who originally in introduced us to the, the farmers who had this application. They're down in Glastonbury, the farmers. Mm. And so we went down there. They wanted to measure these cows automatically, the condition of them. You know. And therefore, um, yeah, it was a very nice project. We Everything fitted together nicely with the kind of thing we could do, you know, what they wanted to do. And um, I think Innovate UK probably liked it because it wasn't typ completely typical. I guess we got this niche, you know, a 3D and deep learning, which is which is a little bit unusual. Most people are just looking at videos and you know, most, most labs in machine vision are looking at 2D stuff most of the time. So, mm. Yeah, so it was Innovate UK, yeah. Uh, we've got a question from Chris Howell. How do you pro prioritize those ideas? Well, all the ideas I was presenting about how we do things and um, I don't know if uh, the applications or the technology there really, but um, sorry, Maurice. Um, if, I, if, if you're asking about the, uh, the um, applications, then to be totally brutally frank, a lot of the time we chase the money, don't you, really? A lot of the time you get funding for something, so you go ahead and do it. <laughs> you know, um, but I think when you get well known in a particular area, I think we've got a little bit of a profile in the set of machine vision and the BRL, a little bit of a profile. So when you get a bit more well known, people do, do come and approach you. Like the ideas for the funding, yeah. Um, well, what we normally do is we get somebody who has an application requirement. Okay, so someone needs us to do something. They've got a company's got a need. They need to sort something out, and they and they realise that our advanced, you know, three D vision technology might provide a solution for them. So actually, so that's where it comes from: a company requirement to answer your question. But then, of course, the first thing after having a chat with them is we look at is is there a funding route for it? Because it, you know we've got brilliant ideas. They've got a strong solution requirement, but Unless it's some kind of funding route, we're, we're scuppered, really. So, uh, so the answer is it's the, it's the industry requirement, but it has to be followed up by a good funding uh, funding channel. Really. Uh, we have another question from Lester's. Uh, with the neural network training, do you train from scratch networks for each different application, or can you reuse the trained weights? I imagine the features are similar between applications. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, in the case of deep learning, um, in an ideal world, we would train everything from scratch. But when you deal with companies, uh, they do usually don't have much data. And actually, I've got some medical work going on, PhDs and so on, which I haven't talked about in the presentation, but it's even worse getting data there. It's really difficult in medicine to get data for various reasons. So we usually don't have enough data. So what we do is that, we, yeah, we do use uh, transfer learning quite a lot. So in transfer learning, it's like in that thing with the, with the weeds and the grass, you know, the, the fact the farmers don't want to mess around in the field, covering loads of data, really, most of the time. You know, they, they just got a limited set of data. So we use transfer learning and data augmentation. I don't know if you want me to go into what they are, but um, there are a couple of techniques whereby you can expand. You, you know, transfer learning is the one you're asking about, where you take um, uh, a network which has been trained on the internet, for example, and then you, you retrain it on a limited data set. And that works amazingly well. 
uh, works remarkably well. And in the case of the pigs I showed you, for example, I think Mark was using a data set that had been changed on, uh, trained on human faces. I don't know if he did hardly any retraining on the pigs, it still worked, you know. It's, it's amazing how you can get things working with similar kinds of data, with a limited amount of data. You might have just, say, 30 images for each class, and you can still get 80 odd percent reliability, because deep learning is so powerful. Yeah. Uh, Chris was uh, just saying he's asking for looking for solution to introduce your questions. I think maybe the best thing for that is probably to email you directly, Lyndon, and just uh, you could probably go in more more depth um, at a certain yeah. time. Certainly, yeah. If you know the company has got a problem, then uh, yeah, you know we'll have a chat. We'll get together, and uh, we do that all the time. You know? Yeah, there's there's lots of different funding routes, and it's. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's it's quite complicated. It can be it can be quite complicated, but yeah, I mean, Innovate UK. I can complain about it, but it's actually one of the simpler <laughs> ways. Go, you know, compared to NIHR or or Europe, you know, it can be a lot more complicated. To be honest, you know. So, yeah, it's quite uh, a good one actually. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Tanvir. Uh, does this neural networking could solve problem in automation and construction? Yeah, that's like interesting. A good question. I was just having a, a chat with a colleague yesterday who, who was exactly into this. Civil engineering, definitely, yeah. So the idea we've got is um, the productivity in engineering in the UK is a bit low. We're looking for ways to improve productivity. In building site analysis, you could have cameras, 3D systems, LIDAR and so on, looking at the environment, analyzing what's going on, checking the movement of stuff around the building site, um, applying deep learning to work out optimal solutions to save money and time when you're moving things around to make sure things are arriving on time. So it's a massive potential for applying this kind of thing in, in, in construction industry. And we're just trying to do something I'd, just trying to get um, Lamine, he's the guy at UWE, who's into this. And we're just trying to get together to get a project off the ground because he published a paper in a journal that I was the guest editor for about a year ago, me and Mel were guest editors for. And it was a nice paper, it was on exactly this, but but we can really provide a lot of expertise on the machine vision and the deep learning side, which and he has all the knowledge of construction. So yeah, it's a hot it's a hot area, I think. Yeah. I think we, we have time for one more question, possibly. Um, before the panel discussion starts, um, if anyone's got anything else they would like to ask. Okay. I think we're probably, probably good. good. So, yeah. if, uh, like, like I said before, if anyone does have any more questions, we can, you can email uh, Lyndon or Mel um, you can access the, everything should be accessible through the brl.ac.uk site. Um, and uh, we'll close the close the session for this one today. Yeah. Thanks, uh, everybody thanks, everybody for, for that. thanks very much, Lyndon. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll drop you out now. Uh, we do have a panel discussion coming up in three minutes uh, on a separate stream so please do if you're interested in in uh, looking at that which is with Arthur, Arthur Richards and Manuel Giuliani who are the co-directors of the lab um, and Sabine who we saw earlier and uh, Minda who is working with the uh, assisted living um, and that's looking talking about the future of robotics so please do join that panel uh, if you are interested and I will probably see you later on this afternoon Thanks very much.